I want to think that um, so what I'm doing right now is not like I try to deal with the moment, but actually like the moment is just a really short period of time in the long journey of the history. Yeah, so the moment right now is something that we must have in order for us to overcome our fear and overcome our comfort So after the, the session today, so what the mindset of me today is like, uh, so this step is something I must have for tomorrow to be better. Yeah, so I'm not like I'm not do what I'm doing for the sake of like just just do it um just do it to overcome but like to it to be better for me and for my commission as well. So yeah, that, that's actually not a learning point, but like something that really relieved my mindset for what I'm doing right now, and I believe more in what I'm doing. Yeah, so it's kind of very um really like cool perspective from Alex yesterday for the essence one. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, I'm sure many of us are thinking about, you know, questions about how to navigate and manage through crisis. Um, last night I share an ISEC story about um, one example of a crisis that I went through. Um, but of course, each and every one of us are going through something very different right now. Um, and, you know, yesterday evening, I talked about this idea of anti-fragility um, this idea that rather than just weathering the storm, maybe we can come out stronger on the other end. Um, so, you know, there's this kind of idea of um, the problem is not the problem, it's how you see the problem. Um, I also talked about, uh, you know, it's not just about positive mindset, it's about genuinely believing that um, there could be some opportunities hidden underneath threats. And um, so the, and I also said in the beginning of the conference that um, every morning, every check-in, I'll leave you with the question to think about. Um, so today's question is this one, what opportunities are there in this crisis right now? Um, so whether it's just the broader pandemic or something more specific, um, if you start to ask yourself, like what opportunities could there possibly be, be, be in this, um, you're more likely to find a more um, innovative way forward. Um, and if I just give a very trivial or simple example is, I remember when we were doing like um, the FASI check-in before this conference, unlike other conferences, like there's a lot more external FASI, right? Um, so that's only possible because like it's a virtual conference. Like if it was physical, like it's too expensive to have that many external FASI. Um, so there's like, although virtual conference is nowhere near as good as a physical one, but there are some ways of taking advantage of it as well, right? Um, even like all of us being able to chat in this, um, so during the session all at the same time without making it so noisy. When you type in the chat, we can all see it at the same, like all at once, even though many people are typing. That's not possible with physical sessions. So these are just very simple examples. But if you think a few levels above in terms of your entire ISEC entity, um, there may be some hidden opportunities from this particular crisis. Um, and you know, I think maybe to, uh, you know, maybe part of the value that I can add as a chair, add as a chair is rather than just telling you ISEC stories, uh, maybe I'll tell you some non-ISEC stories um, as part of my, um, some experiences from the startup that I'm working at now. Um, so that will be basically today. So, but before I do this, um, I'll just give a quick intro about like the startup that I work at now and a little bit about what it does and what I do there. Um, so I work for a startup called Daisy. Um, it was founded not so long ago, just three years ago or so um, by like an experienced business um, leader. And we are an artificial intelligence startup that is a business, you all know what B2B is. Um, and it's also a software as a service. Um, so it's essentially a software product based company um, and various businesses would buy our software on a monthly subscription. And essentially um, what that software does is it, it's in the area of speech analytics. So what we would do is listen to a bunch of um, call recordings that various businesses may have. So I'm not sure if, you know, like when you guys call up customer support and it says things like this call may be monitored or recorded, right? So we are part of that software that listens to these calls and we pull out insights for businesses. So insights about hey, um, your cust a lot of your, your customers are calling about these issues. Maybe there's an opportunity to do more self-service in your product. Or, hey, we noticed that a lot of people that 
do this, say this, don't end up going proceeding with the sale. So maybe there's some sales conversion um, business intelligence around there. Um, so things like this. Um, and in terms of the startup size, we're still quite small, about 20 employees. We've got like a reasonable amount of funding, but by no means like we're, um, you know, we're still in kind of early days, but we've made a lot of progress over the years. Um, in terms of what I do there personally is really like a bit of everything. So when I joined, I was doing some market research. I was doing some consulting, some project management. I was even doing a little bit of like legal stuff, like writing patents, like looking at reviewing contracts, like finance modeling, budgets, a um, bit of accounting, a bit of sales, like just everything. Um, typical stuff that ISEC is, um, especially if you do like MCP or LCP, you learn to do a little bit of everything. Um, so yeah, um, it's just been a crazy ride um, at this startup. Um, and I think the interesting thing is there's a lot of parallels between working at a startup and working in ISEC, um, especially working in MC. So one of those parallels is that there's a lot of uncertainty all the time. Um, it's just a natural part of startup life. And two, like you're really expected to just step up and figure a lot of things out for yourself. Like, and you may feel this a lot as ISEC is. Um, so sometimes it can be kind of frustrating, right? Like why can't someone um, before me or above me just kind of give me a bit more instructions and guidance? But the thing is they haven't been through um, every situation before either, right? Same with the startup. Like the whole point of a startup is you're building something new. So there's no industry precedence that um, has done this exact same thing before. So you're really at the forefront of doing something new. And joining a startup, I think the good thing is I was expecting this. Like I knew that I would be going into uncertainty. And I'm sure it's just a good reminder, like as I say, because when you applied for these roles, you kind of knew that you'd go into a lot of uncertainty, regardless of there was whether there was a pandemic or not. Um, but sometimes, especially when things are tough, sometimes um, we just need a reminder on this. Um, the other thing is, of course, startup, there's limited resources um, and the other thing is there's just non-stop fires all the time. Like there's always something wrong with the product. There's always something wrong with sales. There's always something wrong with marketing. Like there's always some sort of a problem, um, but you really have to choose your battles wisely and know like which ones are more important versus which ones are just urgent. Right. So um, I think working here, one of the coolest things about working here is I had the privilege of joining um, quite early on um, when there was no product, when there was no revenue. And now to almost three years later, we do have a couple of products and we do have, um, we just hit like almost 1.5 million revenue um, like recently. So um, it's just been really cool seeing that startup going from zero to something. Um, and of course, a lot of this um, like frameworks about like designing products, refining products, things like design thinking, um, you know, the lean startup process, um, as well as just maybe a more general, um, you know, kind of Venn diagrams, thinking about like what, where does it make sense to innovate your products versus not? It was just really um, cool just getting hands-on experience on that. So I've just put these slides in here, not to explain these concepts now in this check-in, but maybe you can just check it out in your own time. Uh, these are just my very quick summaries of these really helpful frameworks. Um, the other thing that was really cool um, learning was this idea about market research, this idea about um, product ideation. And I'm not sure, maybe many of you guys have heard this quote before that people don't, customers don't buy a drill, they buy a hole, right? So it's always really important to understand like what's the ultimate problem that you're solving for the customer. Um, but you, then I kind of thought, actually, you can extend this quote even further. So instead of people don't buy a drill, they buy a hole. Um, if you then ask the customer, why do you want a hole? Then they might say, I want to hang a beautiful painting up on the wall, right? Um, then you might say, oh, in that case, maybe you don't need a drill or a hole. Maybe all you need is just like these really um, strong sticker things to stick your painting on the wall, right? Um, so <laughs> I think one of the most um, kind of counterintuitive things I learned at the startup was the customer is actually not always right. <laughs> um, that quote that the customer is always right, I think it's only partially true. I think it needs to be more specified that the customer is always right about their problem, but they're not always right about the best solution. Um, so yeah, I think this is just some examples of lessons I learned. But I think today's story is um, kind of 
wanted to share about how Daisy actually went through the pandemic as well, because it was affecting everyone, right? Um, and this is just a quote I really love about the nature of startups, super accurate. Um, and when Daisy was going through a lot of hard times, even before the pandemic, there's one kind of thing in the ISEX leadership development qualities that I really like, I'll never forget this one. And I always think about this um, when I was in ISEC and even after ISEC as well, it's this transmit positivity throughout uncertainty. Um, so actually, so a bit of a story, right? So in around March this year, our CEO made this big announcement in front of the company. So he's like, okay guys, from now on, no more work from home. Um, like too many people are working from home um, and like it's not, it's affecting the company culture and the morale. Um, there's questions about whether you're working productively or not. From now on, no more work from home. And then just two weeks later, he made this big announcement. Okay, there's a virus. Everyone has to work from home. It's compulsory. Don't come into the office. Like he just completely um, went 180. So actually when the virus hit us, the office just got completely empty. Um, and these is like the immediate steps that the, our company took. So first is we had to cut costs. Um, of course, we had to say goodbye to a lot of people. So maybe around a quarter or a third of our entire team was made redundant. Um, it's just tough, that's business, it's just how it is. Um, also those that stayed, they were forced to take less hours. So tip most people, they drop down to four days a week instead of five days. So already that's your pay reduced by 20%, right? Because you're working 20% less. But on top of that, you're also expected to take a pay cut. Um, so like this really just depended on different, like dip, it, how much pay cut you got reduced depended on how senior you are. So the more senior you are, the bigger the pay cut, the junior you are, less pay cut. So the CEO went with 100% pay cut, um, COO went with like 70%. Like um, for me, I lost like 30%. And then some junior guys, it's like 10, 20%. Um, then the other things is like we negotiated our rent. So we reduced our rent by 80%. It's just everyone, we're just doing everything we can to cut costs a lot, super normal. Um, then what we did is like, okay, now we're in this pandemic situation. We have limited resources, we have limited time. So it actually made us hyper-focused. Like it made us kind of really, um, when it comes to new product feature development or engineering, we just really asked ourselves like, okay, do we have to have this now? or can I just wait a little bit? Uh, and because we had this hyper-focused, in some ways, thanks to the pandemic, we were able, actually able to um, align the future of the product in a way that's much more relevant to what the market was asking for. Um, not only that, like we also started to question like, okay, um, in the past year or so, we've been targeting the finance industry. We've been targeting financial companies, so banks, insurance companies. But now that there's a pandemic, does it mean that are there maybe other industries that we should be targeting? So one of the natural responses is like, yeah, the medical industry. Like, what if there's medical um, healthcare companies that really need our products? Um, so lucky enough, like we had some, we managed to get a new customer um, signing up. Uh, that is like, we managed to sign up the largest um, telehealth company in the United States. So um, telehealth is basically like, instead of seeing a doctor in person, you just talk to a doctor on the phone. So there's this big organization in the US called Telehealth. And like, because we changed our focus, we were actually really lucky and managed to convince them that, hey, you really need this product even more because your doctors are so over overwhelmed and overworked right now. Um, so in many ways, like <laughs> kind of thanks to the pandemic, we were able to sign up our biggest customer ever. Um, of course, the story is more, there's more detail than that, but that's the simple version. Um, other things is like, yeah, really important when we kind of adjusted to the new work from home normal, um, there was a lot of emphasis. And I think one thing the company did quite well is there was a lot of emphasis in terms of making sure that we maintain the, not like we make it really clear what our communication principles are. So things like, um, we use Slack, um, internally. So, um, you know, if you're in the office, let's say nine to five. And if someone needs you really urgently, they should be able to walk up to you, tap you on the shoulder and ask you a question, right? Um, if you're really busy at the time, you just pull out your headphones, sorry, um, can you come back in five minutes? 
So you should be able to do the same thing with Slack. So it was expected that during work hours, you're online the entire time. Um, and, you know, and it's also expected that you should be able to reply quite fast as well, almost as if you're in the office. Um, and yeah, similarly, like actually because we had like less people now in the team, we were now able to do like entire company-wide meetings as opposed to just kind of by team. Um, so that made communication a lot more tighter and more faster iterations. So again, like, yes, it sucked having a smaller team because we had to fire a lot of people. Um, but, you know, one kind of hidden kind of advantage to offset that just a little bit was the ability to communicate much faster and easier. Um, other thing I think they did quite well was like there was a big emphasis on mental health. So a lot of like people would just ask each other all the time, like, how's their mental health? We even had a Slack channel called Mental Health, um, which is like a conversation thread. Um, so there was people were sharing like videos and articles and just really making sure that um, everyone's okay. Um, the other thing is just make sure that we all have the right equipment. So yes, like we're in a pandemic and we're cutting costs and, but still like if it's in important equipment that you need in order to like make sure you've got a proper chair and you know if your house is too noisy or something then we'll make sure that the employees that we do have were looked after um so yeah i mean before when i said day two question is what opportunities are there in a crisis uh, i wouldn't be surprised if some of you were even offended by that question right especially if you have a family member that died from covid or something really bad happened and then if I ask you, what opportunities is there from this, right? Like, of course you would say like, fuck you. That like, how can you say this is an opportunity? But um, in other cases, <laughs> it's, it's, the question is less but that, like, what are the opportunities? It's more just what opportunities could there possibly be? be? So the pursuit of looking for them in itself um, is where um, a lot of the value is. So at least for Daisy and the startup I'm working at, like, in some ways, the, the blessing in disguise for us was that a lot of our kind of less competent people or kind of weaker people, those that weren't making as much contribution or those that weren't as critical, they just got flushed out. So the team became more like lean and mean. Uh, we made the product more relevant, more streamlined, and also have a lot more discipline in terms of finance. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think some of you have seen this meme from a long time ago <laughs> when the pandemic first started. It's like... Um, you know, sometimes change, it doesn't, sometimes if change doesn't happen fast enough on the inside, it, you'll be forced to make change from the outside. Um, and for us, that I definitely, COVID was one of them. So yeah, I hope you found um, this story useful. Um, we're actually quite um, early now, which is good. So you can have more break time or more roll calls. It's probably because um, no one was saying much in the check-in, so <laughs> I skipped that a little bit. But actually, before I go to this agenda, let me go back to this um, opportunities thing. Yeah, this opportunities in a crisis. Um, so now you must be thinking, as I was telling the startup story, um, now you should be thinking, okay, um, that's nice to know which part of that story is relevant for me and my entity or in my context, right? Um, so if you think about a lot of the lessons, it was things like streamlining product, financial discipline, um, taking advantages of communication. Um, and I kind of have like my own personal opinion. This is me just as an alumnus, like my own personal opinion on maybe a way that ISEC might be able to be benefit from this is if you think about um, ISEC's activities, right, over a given year, a lot of time, resources, and effort are actually put into organizing meetings, summits, and conferences, right? Like there's a lot of summits and conferences that happen throughout the year. Um, and a lot of money is put into that too, right? So flying your MC, some of your MCVP exchanges to like operation summits and things. Um, but, and it was really important to have summits like this in order to have like the proper interaction and touch point um, to be able to align different entities on various collaborative projects. But now that there's a pandemic, um, you're communicating with your team on um, Google Meet and Zoom anyway, right? So maybe because communicating virtually is now the new normal within the entity, like there's very little stopping you from communicating to other entities and trying to find ways forward as well. Like the barriers in some ways, it's like, because people are more and more used to communicating virtually, maybe there's opportunities to 
exploit from that of um, kind of communicating across physical borders um, in a more effective way than ever before. So maybe that's kind of like one angle. And then as MCPs, LCPs, MCVPs, like I really invite you to like, just think really carefully, like, yes, this pandemic, it sucks. Like it's restricted travel, it's crippled our finances. Um, it's affected member motivation, um, but still like, is there any opportunities coming from this? Um, and I just, maybe I forgot to mention this yesterday evening, but another thing that just came to mind is um, I was telling you about that IPM story yesterday, right? About um, suddenly the conference got canceled and there was just a lot of shit going on. So something else that happened was in round one of when I was selecting my MCT, there was actually a lot of international applicants, right? MC candidates. But after they heard about this IPM, there was a rumor that the MC won't get a salary anymore, right? So a lot of the um, candidates just pulled out, like, they're like, sorry, I'm not applying anymore. Like almost half of them just um, pulled out, withdrew the application. Um, so at first I was like, fuck, like now I have even less people to choose a team from, um, you know? But then I kind of thought, oh man, actually, um, <laughs> this IPM has, um, done a little bit of MC selection work for me, right? It's taken out the candidates that weren't as like fully committed um, or like their purpose was maybe something else. So in a way, like it just made sure that the team that I did select, there was an expectation that you probably won't get a salary. Um, it's gonna be tough. You might have to take part-time job. Do you still want to apply for this? And every single person that I selected that was on my team, they were like, fuck yes. Like, I don't care if I don't sleep, like I'll work. Like. I really want um, IC Vietnam to like get through this. They were like the most committed team ever. And I think because of this blessing, um, I was, we were able to go through a lot of hard times together. Um, so similarly, when you think about um, EB selection, like yes, next year, there'll be a lot of uncertainty, but still those that will apply, they know how hard it's gonna be. You're probably gonna get the candidates that do apply are the most committed and most motivated ones. So maybe another more opportunity in disguise. Cool. So I'll leave my um, ranting and talking there. Um, and I'll just do the agenda recap uh, kind of preview for today. And then maybe we can take a quick break or do some more roll call. Okay, one sec. Let me find. Okay. So in terms of today's agenda, um, the reason why, another reason I was sharing my startup story is today is a lot about product, right? So today is mostly about um, thinking about the current state of the product, as well as thinking about ways forward with the product. Um, and I'm sure these are the conversations that are quite difficult to have just in your local entities, um, because there's limited opinion and perspective, right? So I really um, believe this day will be super valuable for you guys. Um, and then towards the end, it will be zooming out a little bit more and thinking um, a little bit more about like, okay, we're doing this, um, we need to find ways of um, you know, maybe tweaking our product or tweaking the way we set, position our product and so on. But also, how does that fit in with the five ISEC 2025? So yeah, that's just a quick preview of day two. And uh, yeah, thanks for listening. And I hope you enjoy day two. See you again at checkout, guys. Cheers. Hey, so there's a question. There's a daddy want to ask you a question. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> I wasn't checking all my chats. Uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah, like uh, just a small question. Um, I want to ask, like, seeing from like external and also pre previous Isaac experience, what opportunities do you see from Isaac, and what do you think like we need to focus uh, with this time in this time? Um, yeah. So, so first of all, before I give any answer, just this big disclaimer: like, uh, I'm just an external guy. Like, um, you know, listen to AI, blah blah blah. So, um, I think community. Communication, that's one thing I mentioned already. Um, there's ways of collaborating across different physical, political, geographical borders, as well as within your own entity with other LCDs as well. Um, maybe that's one. Um, two is it's just a really good chance to think back to the basics, right? So uh, if I give a little bit of perspective, right? Um, uh, Based on what I know about ISEC, um, in 2010, 2011, ISEC start to become, in 2011, ISEC globally grew a lot, right? I think it doubled in exchange numbers or something. And part of the reason why it grows so much so quickly is there was this thing called P-Box, where LCs were basically making their own projects. 
Um, and yeah, it was a really fast way of growing exchange. But then in 2012, we realized a lot of these projects weren't very good quality. The standards were all over the place. So in 2012, there's a lot of focus on like, what's the clarity of why? So all those clarity of why sessions, it's AI um, 12, 13, like pushing that a lot. Um, then come 13, 14, there's a lot more emphasis on quality. That's when ISEC start measuring MPS. Um, but the other thing is in 13, 14, there was a lot of push on like top down giving entities answers, right? It was like, okay, this is how, like if your LC is between 50 to 100 exchange, this is how you should be doing marketing. Like it was so specific. Like there was a template and like guides for everything. Um, so by the time it kind of became 14, 15, a lot of entities kind of got used to getting answers. Um, but because of that, the type of ISEC is that we were developing, like it wasn't that like thinking for yourself and it wasn't that adaptable. So 14, 15 was a like brave actions, right? Um, so, you know, what I kind of noticed about an organization, not just ISEC, but just from like me reading about random business and stuff as well, there's always a cycle of like, um, I guess, uh, there's cycles of kind of roughness, uncertainty, changing things versus optimizing things, right? So it's always like, we've got a new context, let's try out new stuff, it diverges. Then once you start getting better at it, you start to over-optimize it, make it efficient, and then you start to converge. So it's all these cycles. So, um, you know, many of the times these cycles are driven internally, but they're also affected by external shocks. So now you've probably got the biggest divergence um, conceptually speaking of like where ISEC should be heading. So I think as ISECers, you guys are probably one of the most important generations, maybe in like the next 10 years, including the last, maybe next 10 years plus previous 10 years, you're probably one of the most important generations because um, the, the conversations you'll have about what our product really is, what it's really doing for the world. Um, there's a lot of shit going on in the world right now as well, right? So, um, you know, now more than ever, it's just thinking about like, Yes, the world has all these needs. It's changed. Um, which parts of our product do we want to change? Which parts do we not want to change? Um, and the thing is, the answers, the correct answers to these things, it's really hard to tell. Um, so, yeah, I think 